Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. I invite you, church, to be seated and to open to John chapter 19 this morning with me. And my heart's been encouraged and blessed so much by just our worship this morning and being reminded of, of what it's going to be like in heaven for all of eternity, right? Come on now. It's going to be exciting, man. Death's a promotion to a child of the Lord. And John chapter 19, we're going to be uh, looking specifically at 17 to 30 this morning, but we want to read uh, verse 1 to kind of get an idea of what's going on and I think about looking at the crucifixion. I think about our study of John that's coming to a conclusion in two weeks. And, you know, we've considered so much in these recent weeks concerning the Jesus' journey uh, out of the upper room. When he left that upper room and he went out with his 11 disciples and, and he kind of went through, uh, went towards Calvary. We've seen so many cool events leading up to that. His kind of final moments he talked with his disciples, his final lessons, his final discipleship opportunities. And, and I think about how much emotions were in these moments. It was a time of intense emotion that we've looked at. It's been a, a time where he went through horrific abuse, a time when he went through unimaginable suffering. Uh, it was a time when he was betrayed by his own uh, countrymen, a time when he was condemned to death. Upon the cross, he was scourged uh, uh, terribly by, by, uh, by those that beat him, and they showed no mercy to him, and, and the, the merciless beatings he went through. And I think as he's made his way through Jerusalem, uh, Jesus has been brought to the hill called Golgotha. And Golgotha is the Hebrew word. It means skull. The Latin word is Calvary. means the place of the skull. And we understand both Calvary and Golgotha are just different uh, linguistic histories uh, of the languages, the sources they came from, uh, of what they called the place where Jesus died. And Jesus went through Jerusalem, he headed towards Golgotha, and, and now he's about to be crucified uh, by the hands of sinful men for the redemption of all mankind. This passage is difficult to consider on many levels. Uh, it reveals the extreme abuse and the suffering of our Lord, uh, it yet also reveals the great hope we have in the, in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we must bear in mind, and we must uh, make sure we consider, the crucifixion of Christ is not some mistake that just happened to happen in history. Now granted, uh, an innocent man was convicted of crimes that he had not committed. He was persecuted, he was sentenced to death for crimes he had not yet committed. But we know as a church, we know as Jesus followers and scripture teaches us, the Bible teaches us that, that it was all part of the sovereign will of God. In order for humanity, in order for humanity to be forgiven of sin, in order for humanity to be forgiven of their offenses towards uh, the Lord, these events had to happen. There had to be an atonement for the sins of mankind. You say, what does the word sin mean? Sin means missing the mark. Here is God's standard, and we missed the mark. Maybe you can think of uh, a bow and arrow or shooting a, a rifle at a target. You missed the mark. And sin, the definition is I missed the mark that God said. And because we missed that mark, there had to be an atonement, a sacrifice made for our sin. And we see here that Jesus fulfilled God's eternal plan of redemption. The Bible says before the world was even formed, that God put a plan in place for Jesus to come and die for the sins of the world. And we see here that Jesus fulfilled the Father's eternal plan of redemption by going to that cross and bleeding out on that cross and dying on that cross. And today I want to examine our text and I want to consider some realities that our text reveals to us. These verses, church, do not speak of some fable. They do not speak of some legend. 
the very calendar system we use is dated B.C. A.D. And it's all around when Jesus Christ came and when Jesus Christ departed. We understand that history records this. It's not just in the Bible. This is not some fantasy or some fable or some myth or some legend. This literally records the crucifixion of Christ for the sin of the world. And I want to take a few moments and I want to look at some realities that we can learn from our study this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 1 and read to verse 16 and then get into our outline in verse 17. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Flogging was a scourging. And uh, the Jews were limited to 39 whips. But the Romans, they were uh, ruthless. They perfected the art of scourging. And they were sometimes, history would write, would scourge so much that some people wouldn't even make it through the scourging. But many times the count surpassed a uh, hundred. And they would go in into the hundreds of just whipping and there was glass and bones and metal strips connected to the leather pieces. And there was nine strips of leather with different fragments in them and designed to go into the, 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 the flesh and the rib cages and to the organs and completely remove every aspect of skin from the body. And they would beat and beat and beat an unbelievable harsh beating that he went through here by the Romans. The Romans were given the, the job to scorch him. And so we believe, as history writes, and most theologians believe, that Jesus' whipping far surpassed 39 stripes because that was what the Jews were limited to. The soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. I want to stop there for a moment, the crown of thorns. If you think about the Garden of Eden in Genesis, the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve in the garden, and you think about when they broke the law and ate of the fruit that they were told not to eat, God said one of the judgments on them was going to be that thorns were going to grow from the crown. Before sin, there was no thorns from the ground. Before sin, uh, there was no labor women. There was no childbirth. Come on, women. None of that was there. And uh, I don't want to go through that myself. And uh, thank God I'm a boy. Amen. Come on. And uh, don't ever have to go through that one. And, uh, but there was, there was childbirth and there was thorns now. And think about the thorns that were part of the curse of sin were the thorns that went into the very scalp of Jesus Christ. An incredible picture here of him taking the punishment of us upon himself. And they put purple robe on him. They said, hey, O king of the Jews. They hit him with their hands. Again, Pilate went out and said to them, look, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I found no guilt in him. And Pilate was the representative of Rome in Jerusalem. The Jews were there under the, under the siege of Rome. And Pilate said, hey, take him yourselves. I, I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was more afraid, and entered the praetorium, which would have been the courthouse, again, and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And I think Jesus was probably giggling on the inside here, all right? And Jesus answered, you would have no power at all over me unless it were given to you from above. Therefore, he, he who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From then, all, from then on, Pilate uh, tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever made himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat of the place called a pavement, which in the Hebrew is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, here is your king. But they shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. I want to begin on our outline this morning, starting in verse 17. I want to look at some realities from the crucifixion, some realities from the place called Golgotha. First of all, it was a place of distinction. It was a place of distinction. In verse 17 and verse 18, we read, He went out carrying his own cross to a place called the place of 
a skull, Calvary or Golgotha, which in the Hebrew is called Golgotha. Therefore, they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the middle. I see, first of all, it was a place of distinction. Calvary is certainly a place of distinction. It is really impossible to fully grasp the enormity, the great enormity of that place and the event of Jesus' crucifixion happening there. First of all, I want to look at the setting. We see the setting. Jesus was led to a hill, and this hill, as we've read, is Golgotha. It was a place where criminals were killed. It was a place like we would look at the gas chamber or the electric chair uh, where they would bring these people that were sentenced to death. And it was a, a, a mountain that was uh, soaked with blood, a mountain that people uh, uh, died and bled out on as they faced the death penalty. And Jesus was led there. And this would have been a place, as we understand, that was familiar to the city and familiar to people. And the Romans would carry out the crucifixions. And here Jesus is on this mountain. And he's on this this place that is, looks like a skull. That's where it gets its name. If you go to Jerusalem today, you see this, this mountain still there, this hillside still there right outside the city. And it looks like a, 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 a kind of resembles a skull. So they called it the place of the skull. And this is where Jesus would suffer and die, the setting of where he's at. And I've tried to imagine how Jesus felt as he made his way to this place. If you think about it with me, church, he was... He was God robed in human flesh. He was the Father in eternity past. He was here prior to creation. Jesus is the one that was a part of forming that hill. He was one part of making that hill, as the Bible says that all things were created by Jesus. So Jesus existed before the very foundations of this world. And the very mountain, the very hill that Jesus would go to and be crucified, he made that hill. And when he made that hill, he would look there and think, one day I will die on that hill. One day I will come down that hill and I will put on human flesh and I will be crucified and go through enormous amount of physical pain and emotional pain and, and even, even spiritual pain from his father turning his back on him because of the sins of the world being placed on him. He made that hill, and yet he died on that very hill. Calvary is not just a place where condemned criminals were put to death. It's the place where the sinless Son of God was put to death. He bore the sin of humanity, and he died in our place, church. The eternal plan of God was about to be fulfilled on this lonely hill outside Jerusalem called the place of the skull, the setting. And then we see the sacrifice in verse 18 that we read. As Jesus was brought to Calvary, he was placed on the cross and he was lifted up. And many times we think about the cross and sometimes we even, we even see different versions of the cross. And there was different styles of the cross depending on what country was doing the crucifixion. This was like a different brand of the electric chair, I guess you could say. It kind of accomplished the same thing, but it was designed differently. And some had the cross beam at the top looking like a T. Some had the cross in the shape of an X. Uh, it is believed that because of the region Jesus was crucified in, that he would have been on a, a beam like this where the crossbar went across the upper middle of the cross. And they would carry that crossbar. They would carry that beam down their journey to Calvary. And many times you would, you'll see uh, uh, kind of uh, plays or movies of the cross and they'll kind of portray the cross being really high in the air. History would say otherwise that they actually wanted the cross to be as low to the ground as possible without the person's feet touching the ground because they needed the feet to be elevated because that was part of the pain and punishment. The nails through the bones and the pressure of the weight Weighing down on that nail would cause the flesh to tear and the ligaments to tear and the bones to crack. And, and the pressure of the nails here would cause the, the, the flesh to tear and the ligaments to tear and the bones to crack. And eventually their, their, uh, their arms would come out of socket from hanging lower and they would try to push themselves up with their weight, which would cause more tearing just so they could breathe because their lungs were collapsing under their bodies falling forward. And they wanted 
wanted the body to be as close to the ground as possible so people could walk by and see the prisoner's face, see the criminal's face, and they would spit on them. They would mock them. They would gawk at them, and they would walk by and see Jesus, and they would, they would make fun of him, and they wanted to see, they wanted people to see up close and personal the blood and the flesh hanging off and the great pain so they would be reminded, don't break the law. <laughs> and they wanted those bodies to be close, and so Jesus here, fully exposed, no clothing on, everything revealed, hanging there, God, creator of the world, on this cross, a traumatic experience. And as I read these words, I was again reminded of the great sacrifice Jesus made for all humanity. The other men on that cross had created, had committed crimes. The other men on that cross committed crimes under their judicial system that required a hanging on a cross, a crucifixion. They were guilty. They were forced to suffer. That was their reward. Yet Jesus was innocent of all charges. He was the sovereign God in bodily form. He had all power. He had all authority. He had all compassion. And yet his very own people rejected him. The great sacrifice of Jesus. And it was there on Calvary where Jesus suffered in our place. The righteous God, the creator of the world, not some stoic distant deity not some distant god that's not concerned the very god of this world came down and put on human flesh and he went to that cross and he he took our sin upon himself and he gave us back his righteousness that is the great sacrifice of the man in the middle jesus on calvary the place of distinction then i want to look at it's a place of opposition a place of opposition verse 19 Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. The writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. That would have been all three common languages of the day. The chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write King of the Jews, but he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. So we see the opposition here as Jesus is on that cross and it kind of dealt with his, 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 his name put above his, his head on that cross. And we see the announcement in verse 19 through 20. As Jesus was crucified, a plaque was put there and Pilate no doubt ordered some of his subservient people, his servants, to write the description, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And, uh, and we understand that that Pilate, it's never recorded that Pilate ever put faith in Jesus for who Jesus said he was. It never, it's never recorded in the Bible that any of the people in the court system there actually accepted Christ. So Pilate did not write this because he was saying, I believe that he's king of the Jews. But no doubt he was writing this because the Jews said that's what he committed the crime in that required him to be hung on that cross. And when I read this, I get amazed. I get amazed that the very ones that consented to his death, the very ones that were hostile towards Jesus, the very ones that consented towards the death of Jesus, God used them. God used a pagan governor. God used a pagan governor to proclaim the deity of his son to those who looked on that day in all common languages. Church, God can use anyone no matter how powerful they are. God can use anyone no matter how wicked of a governor they are, no matter how wicked of a government they have. I think sometimes God in heaven smiles down at us and he's like, oh, my stupid little children. They think they're going to reclaim the world for me. They have no clue that I'm ushering in my plan. Pawns in the hands of God, and I'm not denying human responsibility, but I am saying declaratively, according to Scripture, that God is sovereign over everything. And even the most wickedest of people, even the most heathenistic of people, even the most humanistic and atheistic of people, God can use their very actions to proclaim and to preach the message of the gospel. The church may be silent, but let me tell you something. God the Father is making sure his son is being lifted up, whether we're loud or not. 
God is working here in this situation and he uses this pagan man to present Jesus as the king of the Jews. And then we see the argument, the Jews were upset. Do not give him this title, 21 through 22. How would you give this man this title? He claimed to be the king of the Jews. So Pilate, will you change it to the man who claimed to be the king of the Jews? And Pilate's like, dude, I'm too busy for that. I'm a big, wealthy, rich man, okay? I gotta go get a massage, all right? And I got no time to go change it. When I wrote, I wrote, all right? And they wanted uh, it to be changed. They wanted it to be altered. See, many times people have a hard time trusting Jesus for everything he said he is. There'll be some people that may look to Jesus like, hey, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's this. We kind of give a man-made idea of who Jesus is. But they didn't want to claim Jesus for who Jesus said he was. See, Jesus is the Christ, church. The word Christ means the anointed one. It's the Greek word, Christos. The word here is the idea that, that he has been anointed. The, the word Messiah is, is also a, a word we get uh, that is translated uh, in the Greek Septuagint. It means he's the anointed one. That means that he's been anointed by God to, to take away the sins of the world. He's the one sent by God to die for our sins. And church, I'll tell you right now, Jesus is not just some religious leader. Jesus is not just some man that was a good dude that lived a few thousand years ago that happened to be that our calendar system got dated by him. He's not just some man that history writes about or that healed people or did miracles. My friend, he is the anointed Messiah. He's the anointed Christ. He's the one sent by God that says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's not one of ways. He claims, Jesus claims, I am the only way. I'm not saying it. Read the Bible. Jesus says, I am the only way, not one of many ways, I'm the only way. And sometimes our world does not want to accept Jesus for who Jesus says he is. And here the Jews were arguing that, hey, we don't want the title, the king of the Jews, say he claimed to be that. We're not ready to accept that he is the king, just say he claimed to be the king. Claimed to be the king. So we see the argument that's going on, a place of opposition. Then we see it's a place of condescension. A place of condescension, 23 to 24. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, a part, of each, a part for each soldier. And also his tunic, as most believe, he was fully exposed, no clothing, all of it was ripped off. Now the tunic was seamless, woven from the top to bottom, so they said one to another, let us not tear it, but let's cast lots for it. We want this tunic to be decided whose it shall be. This happened to fulfill scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, Man for my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. So you say, what were the soldiers doing at the foot of the cross? So imagine Jesus' church, his organs exposed, his, his arms dislocated, his joints ripping out, his, uh, his, his blood coming everywhere, uh, just a ruthless scene, unrecognizable. And these soldiers are there at the foot of his corpse, at the foot of his body, at the foot of the cross with his very clothing. And they're gambling for who gets the tunic. The tunic was a, an overcoat they kind of would wear uh, over them as they'd go throughout the city. the clothing of the day, and they wanted that piece of clothing. They were gambling for it. We see the actions here reveal the condescension of the soldiers on Golgotha. We see the humility of Jesus, the humility in verse 23. As Jesus hung upon the cross in shame before the onlookers, the soldiers gambled for his garments. He bore the sins of the world, suffering from horrible abuse, and the soldiers added to his shame by gambling for the few possessions he had. Jesus had nothing. We, we are starstruck in our culture, aren't we? We glamorize, especially out here. I mean, you ever see a star? When I first got out here the first time, I'm like, oh my word, I can't believe Jay Leno Studios, like right there, man. It's like, we get starstruck sometimes by celebrities, by athletes, by wealth. We, we, we celebrate it, we, we crave for it, and yet we see the very God of this world, the very creator of this world, the great humility. He had nothing even of his clothing in those final moments of his life. There, bleeding out, naked upon that cross. He wouldn't have been someone that our culture would have glamorized or promoted or, or been starstruck around. We see the great humility of Jesus. These soldiers here gambling at the foot of the cross. They were playing games at the foot of the cross. Church, may we never play games at the foot of the cross. This is the very son of God. And yet he has more than a few worldly possessions. He has them stripped of everything he had left on his body. They didn't have the dignity to offer his clothing to his mother that was standing close by. 
the final possessions of her son. They didn't have the dignity to turn them over to the family and say, here is what your child is wearing on their last day. You can have it for keepsakes. They, they were getting it for themselves. They were gambling it for themselves. I think about the great humility of Jesus Christ as Philippians chapter two tells us in verse seven and eight. But he emptied himself. He emptied himself. This is the incarnation of God, God incarnate, God in flesh. He emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. We see the great humility that Jesus went through. The humility, then we see the prophecy here, the prophecy in verse 24. I love this part here in verse 24. It says, and I want to reread it so we see it. It says that, so they said one to another, let us not tear it, but let's cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This happened don't miss this, church. This happened to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. It says here that there was a prophecy given, and if you look up that final portion of that verse, you'll see it in Psalms twenty-two eighteen. Psalms 22, 18 prophesied that the Messiah, the Christ, the one that was going to come, would have his clothing gambled for there at the foot of the cross. That it'd be, it, would be, uh, it would be divided, of the, his, his garments would be divided, it says, and for my clothing they cast lots. We see a direct fulfillment of prophecy. And you know what I think about? I think about the sovereignty of God kind of playing out here. Church, let me tell you something. God the Father crosses every T and dots every I. When he says it's going to happen, you believe it. It will happen. All the way to the very detail. It wasn't like there's some abstract prophecy in the Bible. Like he'll come one day and it doesn't tell us where he's coming from. No, it tells us where he's coming from, from what city he's coming from. It tells us how he's going to be proclaimed. It tells us what's going to happen on the cross. The prophecies in the Bible, church, come true to the very details. When I think about the unfulfilled prophecies in the Bible that still have not yet to come, you bet you, church, every T will be crossed, every I will be dotted. If God the Father said it will happen, it will happen. This very thing happened. God used evil soldiers to fulfill prophecy. Guess what? He'll use evil governments to fulfill prophecy. He'll use evil men and women to fulfill prophecy. No matter how hard we in the church try to fight, he will use them. And he'll even use our own naiveness to usher in the second coming. We understand that the Father here is in complete control of what's happening in John 19, 24. It was a fulfillment of prophecy, the very casting lots of the clothing. And then we see, fourthly, it's a place of devotion. It's a place of devotion. Verse 25 to 27 but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which was John, standing thereby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciples, Here's your mother. From that time, the disciples took her to his own home. I want to look at the gathering here, the gathering around this great devotion in verse 25. Most had rejected Jesus up to this point. Most had ran away. Most had said, we don't want to have anything to do with this man. We don't want to suffer pain. We don't want to be, be hung up there also. Most started to deny and back away from Jesus. But here we see a gathering of his mother. No doubt a mom would have been there seeing her son's final moments. We see the mother. And then we see the gathering of Mary Magdalene, which was a demon-possessed woman, a demon-possessed woman that we would have been like a schizophrenic walking down the street that we'd see, someone that we'd say lost their mind, that Jesus cast out the demon from, and we see her there, and then we see John, the disciple that Jesus loved, kind of gathered there at this moment. We see him telling John to take care of his mother. Take care of my mom, he said. You say, why was John there? Was John there to fight for Jesus? I don't think he was like Peter. Peter wanted to fight for him. John was there because John loved what Jesus loved. <laughs> Jesus loved his mother. And then about John kind of stepping up. He had a close relationship with Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved. And 
John was no doubt maybe given the responsibility here to take care of the mother of Jesus. And he's walking with the mother of Jesus. And no doubt she's agonizing and she's crying, seeing her, her child up there on that cross, trying to make sense of it all. And John is there. He's risking his life. He's risking his, his, his position, his power. He's risking his name of what people would think of him. And he's walking with the mother of Jesus. Why? Because I believe John loved what Jesus loved. That ought to challenge all of us today. That ought to challenge all of us today because most Christians today have a hard time publicly identifying with Jesus. It's like we slayed the fatted calf if we prayed openly at a restaurant. <laughs> It's like, it's like we slayed the fatted calf we come to church one Sunday a month. We, we don't want to push Jesus on our friends. We don't want to talk about Jesus too much. We, we don't want to. We, don't, we want to be careful. And, and yet we see a boldness of John. We see a dedication of John. And, and we live in a day and age where most Christians struggle just to identify with the Lord in, in Sunday morning church attendance. Yeah, a struggle to identify with the Lord, uh, kind of living for the Lord and preaching the Lord and openly claiming Christianity. John is there loving what Jesus love church may we always love what jesus loves and may we never be ashamed to stand for what jesus stood for we love talking about our pet hobbies and our pet things and our our, our man-made agendas and yet we oftentimes remain silent when it comes to the things jesus talked about we see the great dedication of john in this gathering and then we see the grace of jesus on display in verse 26 through 27 when jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved, verse 26, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, here's your son. Then he said to the disciples, here's your mother. From that time, his disciple, his disciple John, took her to his own home. Oh, church, we see in the final moments of the pain of Jesus, you don't understand the great agony he was under. He didn't have some medication to ease the pain. The final moments of the great agony, he's still looking down at his mother, no doubt as a son, he wanted to hug his mom one more time. No doubt as a mother, she wanted to kiss her son one more time. And no doubt there was a great turmoil there. And, and no doubt there was fear on Jesus' part because he was 100% human. At the same time, he was 100% God. And, and here he, he says, John, just take care of my mom. Wouldn't that be the words of a son? Just take care of my mother, man. Make sure my mom's okay. You see the great love of Jesus in his great pain. You see the great love of Jesus for people. You see the great love of Jesus for people, even in the deepest pain and the deepest time of sorrow in his life. And church, may I tell you today, he has that same crazy love for you. He loves you so much that he came down here and died for you. He wants you to be taken care of. He wants to spend time with you forever in heaven. That is the God of this world, church. And he came down and he paid the price for you. We see the great grace of God. If you've never tasted of Jesus, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I'll tell you something, church. He's asking you today to do it because he loves you. A place of devotion. Then we see, fifthly, a place of redemption. We've listened well. I want to close up on the place of redemption, church. Don't zone out on this. This is the crucifixion of our Lord. Verse 28, after this, Jesus knowing that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. So a bowl full of sour wine was placed there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on his, some kind of like vinegar, and they held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. It's a place of redemption. <laughs> Praise God for redemption, man. There's so much in this final verse. There's a lot that we could consider that we don't have the time to consider. But I want to focus on the redemption Jesus secured for us in his final moments of life. First of all, we see the triumph in verse 28. We find an interesting and definitive statement here in verse number 28. Jesus knew all things were now accomplished. The onlookers may have viewed a defeated man. The onlookers may have looked at him and goes, yeah, he was really the king of the Jews. Look, I'm bleeding him out on that cross. And they saw a defeated man, one whose claims had not worked out, a complete failure to society. However, the perception of the onlookers did not reveal the reality of Jesus Christ. Jesus had known of this moment since before time began, as I already stressed this morning, he had fulfilled the plan of God completely up to this point. Jesus knew he'd been obedient to the will of God in securing the redemption for all of humanity. 
although he was enduring the great pain, this was a triumphant moment for Jesus Christ. He was not defeated here at this moment. He was triumphant at this moment. And they were looking at him and they were mocking him and making him feel like he was a loser. And yet he was faithful to the plan of the Father. And he was given hope to the world. And he was, he, he was given life to the world. He was given newness to the world. He was triumphant in this very moment. We may live in a world today that looks down sometimes as we, we look at this is a Christian country church. America is far from a Christian country. This is not a Christian world. There's paganism everywhere in other worlds, in our own world, our own country. There, there's a great need for the gospel to advance. And people will look at Christianity and may think, oh, those people are just fooled. Those people are just believing a lie. Oh, oh those people are, 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 are losers. Sometimes you may be going through something in your life and you, you feel like you're not triumphant. Have you ever been going through something and you just don't feel triumphant? <laughs> You just feel like life is beating you up. You feel like, man, I'm not a winner. I'm not on the winning side. I, I love a song that was put out, and I don't know if you're like me, but when I find a song I like, I play it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until I hate the song. <laughs> I got a song I, I really, 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 really like right now, and uh, it was put out by Elevation Worship, and, and, and the song here is talking about the victory we have in God. It's talking about the triumph we have in God, and here's what the writer says. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. The weapon may be formed against us, church, in this world, but it will not prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. For the battle belongs to the Lord. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to worship my way through this battle. I'm just going to worship my way through. Hey, it says, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it and make it into some good church. We are not defeated followers of Jesus. We are not defeated children of God. We are triumphant children of God that's who we are and so when you're having that bad week and you're feeling defeated you put your chest out put that put that that back and you walk around and you put a head high is I'm a child of God I'm a child of the king it may be hard but I'm gonna worship my way through this battle I'm gonna walk right into work and I'm gonna worship my way in my good days and my bad days I'm gonna worship my way through the battle because I belong to the triumphant God in heaven we see the triumph of Jesus here, and then we see the transaction. Verse 30. Oh, the great transaction here. Verse 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Oh, the three most powerful words in the Bible. It is finished. The three most important words in the Bible that if it never happened, we'd have no hope, church. It is finished. The three most important words in the Bible, if they never were said, we would have no future of forgiveness. It is finished. The greatest statement he proclaimed here that I've shed the blood. I've given the sacrifice. I've laid down my life. I've taken the physical pain. I've taken the emotional pain. I've taken the spiritual pain. I will be separated for this moment from the Father. I walked through the valley so I can give back my righteousness to my children. It is finished. No longer do you got to hope you go to heaven. No longer do you got to strive that one day you'll make it. No longer do you got to follow a man-made religious system trying to hope that you'll be welcomed into heaven one day. No longer do you got to try to believe these lies, but you can rest in me that I took your sin, that I took the curse of the law, that I took the punishment because I love you and I've given you back my righteousness. I've given you back my perfection. It is finished. It is done, church. You are forgiven. Those are the words he said there. The great love of Jesus for us. And church, I want to say right now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, give your life to him today. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, let his love motivate you. Let his love give you a kingdom mindset. Let his love get your focus off of the now and get your focus on the then. Let his love push you, church. Let his love motivate you. Not man, not agendas, not manipulation. Church, let his love push you, man. 
That's the greatest motivation we can ever preach about is the great love of Jesus for the church. He loves you, man. You glad he loves you? Can we just clap loud for Jesus because he's amazing? He's your amazing man. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you right now. We thank you, God, for your great love for us. 